Welcome to Country Bible Church. We're glad you joined us this evening. We'll prepare ourselves this evening by having a few moments of silent prayer, the option of naming privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here to focus on your mighty word. The more we know your word, the more we understand life. The more that we can make good decisions. The more that we can be ready to accept those eternal rewards and decorations and privileges. And in the meantime, we're so anxious for our Lord Jesus Christ to return. But in the meantime, we're in this Oh, world that is insane. And that's okay. We're going to stick to our needing, keep our priorities right, and continue to grow in grace and knowledge. We pray that you will help us to focus this evening. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't ever think or say that it can't get worse. I've got just a little snippet of about two, maybe three articles, only a couple of paragraphs in each one to kind of bring you up to speed on the insanity. This has only got three paragraphs to it, but if you haven't heard this, you're, you, you would think it never could happen in America. This is by the Daily Wire. It came out July the 10th. The title is Seattle allegedly selecting city employees for anti-racism training based on skin color. This is the, just like I said, three paragraphs. The white municipal employees in Seattle, Washington, Washington were called to a special meeting. When they got there, they found out that the meeting was about, and this is in quotation marks, interrupting internalize racial superiority and whiteness. That doesn't make much sense, but I'll give it to you again. The meeting was about interrupting internalized racial superiority and whiteness. Evidently, they think that was going on and they're going to interrupt it. And remember, only white employees were called to this meeting. They were told that their white qualities were offensive and unacceptable. Three qualities were given. Perfectionism, objectivism, and individualism. Now, silly me, I thought those were good traits. They were ordered to stop displaying those characteristics of their whiteness. They were ordered to give up. Here's a list. Comfort, physical safety, control over other people and the land, time with their family, relationships with other white people, niceties with their neighbors and colleagues, and the certainty of their jobs. They were ordered to give up all of that. How do you, how do you get rid of whiteness? We were born the skin color. This is the exact opposite of even when the Dr. King was in the 60s handling the bias that was going on then. And his remedy was just the opposite of all of this. And this... Have, have any of you ever heard this? Did any, any of you hear that before? Uh, in Seattle, yeah. And, and that would bring outrage. But uh, that's just one. That, I mean, that's, I'm just going to give you a snippet here. Um, let's see. Teachers Union in L.A. is three paragraphs, too. This is the headline. 
Schools can't reopen unless charter schools shut down. Police are defunded, and Los Angeles Teachers Union says. This is what they say. You know there's a big to-do about are the schools going to open or not. And, of course, the dark side doesn't want them to open. They don't want anything good to happen because that might bode well for our president. They can't have that. So here's just three paragraphs. <clears throat> a major teachers' union in Los Angeles says the district can't reopen unless there is a moratorium on charter schools. Now, the reason they hate charter schools is because they are fantastic. They're competition. They've already limited the number of them. And so these charter schools are taking inner city minorities and nearly 100% sending, sending them to college. And they are doing 10 times better than the public schools. And so the, there's five, five, what, no, 50,000 people in line to get in charter schools in New York City. And instead of allowing these charter schools to take over old abandoned schools, no, they bulldoze them down before they let them to come into it because, again, they are competition, which they could not have because they're, they're, they wouldn't laugh. So they demand a moratorium on charter schools. Oh, and until the police are defunded, the kids can't go back to school unless the charter schools are, are is no more a moratorium. They can't go back until the police are defunded. Oh, and until the, there is Medicare for everyone, and until there is a wealth tax and a federal bailout too. That's what they're demanding. Okay. These, we're just saying that the district, and by the way, the, 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 those are all terms set by the teacher's United Teachers in Los Angeles, a 35,000 member union in Los Angeles, and uh, that's what they released with their policy today, or the 10th. So again, they said the kids can't go back to, to school unless there is a moratorium on charter schools. And they have to just crush the charter schools so their nefarious uh, propaganda and brainwashing can continue. And they're doing that at the cost of young people, children, who will not get a good education. They don't care about that. And that the police must be un uh, defunded before they come back to school. And until there's Medicare for everyone, and until there's a wealth tax and a federal bailout too. So all of the things that has happened in Los Angeles that have cost no doubt billions of dollars, the, te the teachers say they're not going to go back to school, the kids can't go to back to school until there's also a bailout for all that. Now this is uh, what the, I think one of the president of the union said. Police violence is a leading cause of death and trauma for black people and is a serious health and moral issue. That is a bald-faced lie. It is just as wrong and as it can be. The, <clears throat> the policy paper calls on authorities to shift the astronomical amount of money devoted to policing to education. Now, just think about that a minute. We're not going back to school. And yet, the money that goes to fund the police has to go to, edu to, the, to education, and they're not even having school? and other essential needs such as housing and pub public health. UTLA president of this big union, Cecily Mayart Cruz is her name, says, we all want to physically open schools and be back with our students. That's a lie. You heard what all the things they said that must happen. But lives hang in the balance. Safety has to be the priority. And the, the, there is probably, there's something like 0.001% of uh, children, uh, any child dying of the virus, and they're proving that. They're, by the way, they're opening up 
with no strings attached all over the world, all these different countries, but not here. And you know the reason why. Because of the election, and they're going to try to make it look just as horrible as they can to hell with the kids. So that was uh, the other one. I think I have one more here real short. Let's see what it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> here it is. I can't get my little cursor deal on there. Okay. There. City mandates, uh, city mandates masks threaten to up to a year in jail for repeat violators. This is in Colorado. It says a city in Colorado has mandated that all the residents wear face masks to battle COVID-19 and the repeat violators could face up to a year in jail and are, and are a $2,650 fine. <clears throat> now listen to this closely. Inglewood City Manager Jay Sean Lewis issued an emergency order. This is coming from a city manager, not the mayor, not, not the governor, not the mayor, not the city council, not the district attorney, a city manager. Who in the heck is a, what does a city manager do? Uh, and it says he has issued an emergency order. A city manager does that. I don't know about you, but that just gets my goat. Talk about nerve. He's ordering this emergency order that was approved by the city council on Monday requiring every, everyone over six years old to wear a mask that covers their noses and mouths while they are, while in any retail store commercial or government offices, as well as the health care facilities and even veterinary offices. And the edict says this, enforcement actions are intended to be culminative in nature, and Inglewood may pursue one or more of civil, criminal, and administrative actions, fees, fines, sentences, penalties, judgments, and remedies, and may do so simultaneously or in succession, and this is all coming from the city manager. Have we lost our minds? A city manager is going to wield that kind of power? I don't, I, I don't see the outrage in your mind. I, 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 this is a city manager. He's just a tick up above the janitor. And he's going to issue this with these kind of penalties, and they're going to enforce it? Well, enough of, enough of that. Yes, sir. Good for them. I'm glad that we live in Brenham. Okay, roll your sleeves up. We're going to Romans. Starting on... Lesson 8, gird up your loins. This is not going to be for sissies. I'll tell you right off, most churches, and maybe to some degree all churches, the congregation likes it when there's a stirring message and there is emotions and there is just... Uh, a, a spirit that's uh, of uh, praise or whatever it may be. But that's not where you grow. You grow in the trenches. What we have tonight is not going to scintillate anybody because we're going to be down in the trenches. But that's where you learn. So take your Bibles and open to Romans chapter 1 verse 2. And we are going to start with verse 3. There it is. Is that big enough? Y'all need it bigger. Okay. Now, one thing that I did that I'm going to make it a custom of doing, <clears throat> this is verse 2. 
We went and I exegeted, exegeted verse 2. We brought out a lot of principles and things about it. And when I get to the end of a verse, I'm going to give the translation with the salient points in there. You could say it's an expanded translation. So all the things that make up a verse that I added and explained or whatever is going to have an asterisk by this verse. See, this is verse 3 that we're going to look at, but it doesn't have an asterisk. This means it's after everything's been said and done, this is the best way to understand that verse, and I'm going to have parentheses and notes inside it, and I think that might be helpful. So we start in verse 3. Well, we have, let's just read verse 2 since we have it right here in view. Which he, God the Father, promised beforehand, and that is in eternity past, through his prophets in the Old Testament Holy Scriptures. That is prelude. Now we go right into verse 3. Concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. Now, when I underline these, these words here, those are the ones that I'm going to deal with in teaching. So the first thing we see is concerning his son. And that's the first thing we're going to do is this phrase right here and so forth. So when we go, we're going to take this a bite at a time and these Phrases or words that are underlined is what we're going, to, we're going to deal with. So, concerning his son are the first words. The word concerning is the little Greek preposition called peri, P-E-R-I. That little word is also used in English for periscope and a perimeter, peri in both of them. And it means that which encircles. And it's that which is surrounded or centered upon something. So you probably didn't know that when you said periscope or perimeter that we had a Greek word in there that means to encircle. Now the gospel is all about, and then I have here in brackets, when I say all about, I'm talking about using the word peri, it means surrounded and centered upon Jesus Christ and what he has done. I got that little bit of information from John Vernon McGee through the Bible commentary. So concerning his son means surrounded, centered upon, and then it is, of course, Jesus Christ. So we say we have here concerning his son, Perry, we just went over that. Now we're going to say, who was born of a descendant of David. So we're going to start with who was born, just those three words. Jesus was conceived in a virgin's womb by the Holy Spirit according to Luke chapter 1 verse 35 and Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 and was delivered normally. He had an ordinary birth. He did not have an ordinary conception. <laughs> Very unordinary. In fact, it was the only conception that didn't have a male in it, or didn't have a human male. It was a virgin birth. Now I'm right here. The word born, see right here? The word born... I hit something. I have to go back right here. Now we're good. Okay. The word born emphasizes that he is an actual historical figure. He, d he was, wasn't a vision. He didn't just vaporize and there he was. And He was born emphasizes that he is an actual historical, historical figure. Many well-known ancient writers, inclu including the Roman Historian Tacitus, spelled T-A-C-I-T-U-S, in his Annals, 15.44, these are people who, in their history, in, the, in their accounts, they make point that Jesus was born. And then you have the familiar Jewish historian Josephus, in his Antiquities, 2.18.3, also mentioned that and Pliny 
P-L-I-N-Y, the younger, in his letters 10.96, comma 97, define those, verify Jesus' historicity. Now, a lot of people put a lot of stock in extra-biblical sources, and I don't know about these other two. I would assume they were like Josephus, who was an unbeliever. So it's not someone there that has the axe to grind and their bias. These were historians that were just chronicling what was going in, going on, on in the time that they were living. These are extra biblical sources that would also testify that Jesus Christ was really born. He was a real person. It's not the figment of someone's imagination. It's backed up not only by the Bible, which is where the real source of truth is, even in unbelievers made it certain that they that history was recorded re, 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 uh, <clears throat> referring to Jesus Christ. So he was born, and then we have of a descendant of David. Jesus Christ was born into the royal family of King David. As eternal God, Jesus Christ is royalty because he's equal with the Father and with the Holy Spirit who are his royal family. So Jesus Christ from all eternity has had a royal family of deity. God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. He was born into the line of David. What was He was King David, which was royalty. Right here. So Christ, so Christ on the cross was divine royalty and Jewish royalty. But after his victory on the cross, Satan was defeated. That's important for you to know. Satan has already been defeated. When Jesus Christ made it to the cross and he fulfilled his mission in paying for the sins of the world, Satan was defeated. And after, see, he was de defeated. <clears throat> and after his resurrection and ascension, he became a new type of royalty sitting at the right hand of God in heaven. You find that in Mark 16, 19. So he has, he's already had royalty from his divine family. He was royalty because of his physical family, which was King David, which was royalty. And now that it is sitting at the right hand of God, and he has his victory over Satan, the angelic, one, uh, the angelic conflict is now moot. Satan is just trying to stir up whatever he can, but Satan is his course is already set. Now we church age believers are his royal family through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Old Testament believers are the family of God. And in the Old Testament, this new royalty where Jesus Christ was victorious in his first advent and is sitting at the right hand of the Father is a new royalty. And he has a new family now, and that is church-age believers. And that's why we call ourselves, or at least I call you, royal family. Because this new royalty that Jesus acquired by being victorious and sitting at the right-hand side of right hand throne of God now, that, that shows that God has accepted his sacrifice he completed the mission now the church in Rome was in a Gentile nation actually it's, that's not exactly it, Rome was a city state but you can conceive it as Gentiles and Jesus being a descendant of David wouldn't mean much, not much to them. They didn't know anything about that. But its congregations weren't all Gentile. There were a number of Jews 
in the congregation, and they would certainly know the importance of the statement that Jesus was a descendant of David. That's why this is put in here. Remember, Paul had never been to this church. He didn't found this church. But he knew that there were Jews there, and so when he is going in verse 3 here, he's saying that he was born as a descendant of David according to the flesh. So now we, we're through with verse 3 as far as exegeting it. And you see this asterisk here. And this is the expanded version. Concerning his son, God's son, who was born of virgin birth, of a descendant of David, which was royal family, according to the flesh. And flesh simply there means humanity. Referring to Christ's humanity. That seemed pretty easy, didn't it? Well, it's not anymore. I, f I spent... I guess at least seven hours on this verse. Maybe a little more than that. I'm the one that, you know, said, let's do Romans. Now, the good thing about Romans is you can, you can grow, you can learn so many things. It's just packed. Every verse nearly is you can learn and grow. But you have to concentrate and you have to really think and apply. And for me, it's ten times worse when you get to a verse like verse 4. And you'll see as it unfolds. First of all, you'll notice that in verse 4, I have two versions. I have the New American Standard Version and I have the ESV, uh, uh, English Standard Version underneath it. You'll also know I have some colors in there. And I'll tell you why. We're going to read Romans chapter 4, verse 1, uh, uh, excuse me, Romans chapter 1, verse 4 from the New American Standard Version first. And this is what it says. Well, let's just start with verse 3 and we'll read right into 4, okay? Who was declared the Son of God with power. Oh, excuse me, I'm on verse 4. This is verse 3. Concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. Now verse 4 who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Savior. Now, that is exactly the way it is worded. But the reason I put it in different colors is because the same verse in the ESV version has taken what is blue here. You see this right here? And the ESV, it has put it here. And the red has put, is put where the according to the holiness is. So you can see that. Here we go. Verse 4, English Standard Version. And was declared to be the Son of God in power. That reads exactly like verse 4. But now, instead of having according to the spirit of holiness down at the bottom, we say power according to the spirit of holiness and then by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now you may say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, the big deal about it is in English, word order is everything. You change the order of the words and it means something different. In the Greek, you, it wouldn't even matter. It's because it's an inflected language. They go by the uh, prefixes and suffixes and infixes. And it's, uh, you could just take words in, a, let's say this sentence, this verse 4 here. Take all the words and put them out on little pieces of wood and put them in a jar and shake them all up and throw them down on the ground. And someone in the Greek could read them and not even slow down and know what, exactly what they meant. But in English, this is not, neither one of these are the, word, the exact word order of the Greek. But if you were reading Greek and translating it to the English, it will sound like one or two of these, one of these two. And this is one of the things that took me so long is 
that it makes a difference whether, let's look at first of all, when it says in the King James Version, who was declared the Son of God with power. And then it says, by, with power, by the resurrection of the dead. That means he was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. It's not he got his power from the resurrection of the dead, right? Well, look at in the ESV. And was declared to be the Son of God in power, with power, according to the spirit of holiness. And in English, those two things are different. Both of them can't be right. So I, that's where I just grinded out and I finally decided the closest version that made sense to me was the English Standard Version, and you'll see that as it plays out. And so I'm just erasing the New American Standard Version of verse 4 because I believe what I can tell is that Romans 1.4 in the ESV is closest to what it would be translated into the English and make sense and be accurate. Are you all with me? You understand? Okay. That was the easy part. So again, we're going to start with each word here, and we're going to take it and look at it. See what it says. So, <clears throat> Romans 1.4, and was declared. That means Jesus Christ was declared. The word there for was declared is horizo, H-O-R-I-Z-O. It's a participle. It's an aorist passive participle. Now remember, participles don't have a mood, so it won't be the aorist passive indicative or anything like that. Participles don't have a mood. It only has a voice and a tense, so that's what I'm giving you. It's an active voice and passive uh, I mean, uh, active, it was, in time, it's, it's the active in the passive voice. To make the ter determination about an entity, this is the de definition, to de determine upon or fix or set. That's what the word horizo means. Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power by the divine decrees. So when we're looking up here, let me see if I can lower it just a little. And was declared, oh, I, that's not, yeah, that's it. And was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit by his resurrection from the dead. When it says, and was declared, declared by whom? And when? This is talking about he was declared in eternity past by the divine decrees. Do I need to stop and explain a little about the divine decrees? Anybody want me to expand on that a bit? Okay. If you turn to Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 through 10. You're going to see one of the places that has to do with the divine decrees. Isaiah 46, and verse 9 and 10. Isaiah 46, 9. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. By the way, I just want to do this for a little exercise. I'm on Isaiah 46, 9. You're, you're in the psalm. <laughs> Just for a little, um, a little interesting thing here, turn to Isaiah 45, and I'm going to take you to the verses where it says 
that I am God and there is no other. This verse, this is said all throughout chapter 45 and 46. Verse 5, I am the Lord and there is no other besides me. There is no God besides me. Verse 6, down at the bottom, I am the Lord and there is no other. Verse 14, God is, this is at the bottom of verse 14, God is with you and there is none other, no other God. Verse 18, right down there at the bottom of verse 18. I am the Lord and there is no none else. Verse 21, and there is no other God besides me. There is none except me, was verse 21. And verse 22, I am God and there is no other. And now we're at verse 9 in chapter 46. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I think he's trying to get a point across. <laughs> I am God and there is no one like me. Verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Now put a little notation with an error to that saying divine decrees. He decreed it. And what's so important about the divine decrees is that it is really celebrating and focusing on God's omniscience. Omniscience is the way it's spelled. It means his knowledge. There's nothing that God doesn't know. Nothing. And so in eternity past, he decreed all the things that would come to pass. He didn't make anything happen. He didn't force anything. But his omniscience knew what was going to happen from where the start was, from the, from the moment that the earth was created on to all eternity, God knows every little detail of everything. He knows everything. Nothing is left out of his knowledge. And so he decreed the things that were going to come to pass because he knew they were going to come to pass. He doesn't make them come to pass, but it is to celebrate his glory in his omniscience. And one of the things that was declared in eternity past is that Jesus Christ is going to be the Son of God. And so when we are in Romans chapter nine, uh, 1 verse 4, and it said, <clears throat> and was declared, or you could say decreed, to be the Son of God. God is the one who decreed it, declared it in eternity past. It's called the divine, excuse me, the um, divine decrees. Y'all ready to move? Uh -huh. Okay. So here we are on this sentence right here. Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power by the divine decrees in eternity past. And we just read Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 through 10. The Greek word from which the English word horizon means to distinguish. Just as the horizon serves as a clear demarcation line dividing the earth and the sky, the resurrection of Jesus Christ clearly divides him from the rest of humanity, proving irrefutable, irrefutable evidence that he is the Son of God. And this word horizo, which is our verse, it's, it's translated, was declared, is, uh, is where we get our, our word horizon because it makes a declaration as well. It separates, it's distinctive, separating the sky from the earth. And then it goes on to say here that just as the horizon serves as a clear de demarcation line dividing the earth and the sky, the resurrection of Jesus Christ clearly 
divides him from the rest of humanity. That's, that's the line of demarcation. He is man, but he's not like every other man because he's also God. There's a horizon, there's a line of demarcation, a separation there. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ clearly divides him from the rest of humanity, providing irrefutable evidence that he is the Son of God. It was declared in eternity past. It came into fruition after he was resurrected. We're going to see, you don't ever see the title Son of God in the Old Testament. It's not there. It didn't occur until after he was resurrected that he was proven that he was horizo, he was separate than everyone else, and that he's then called the Son of God. So the next thing in our verse is, and was declared to be the Son of God. So we're looking at the Son of God here. The good news is, all about Jesus Christ. The gospel news is all about Jesus Christ. Remember, centered on, which is a title Christ expresses. The reason that the, the, the Son of God is a title of Jesus Christ that expresses the voluntary submission of the second person of the Godhead to the first person of the Godhead for the purpose of fulfilling the program of redemption established in eternity past. Are you following that? Let me, this is thing, I'll, I'll read these things again because you hear it, but I want you to absorb it. We're talking about the Son of God, which is a title for Christ that expresses, that demonstrates his voluntary submission of the second person, which is Jesus Christ of the Godhead, to the first person, which is God the Father, for the purpose of fulfilling the program of redemption established in eternity past. In other words, Jesus Christ voluntarily took on the role of the Son in order to, to fulfill the plan of redemption that God had for mankind. And that was decided in eternity past. Son of God ind indicates full deity. Son of man indicates true humanity. Was Jesus Christ full deity before he went to the cross? Yes. Was he full deity when he was a baby in the manger? Yes. So it's not that he acquired deity when he was resurrected, he was recognized then as deity, the Son of God. The divine decrees of eternity past declares Jesus Christ to be the Son of God because of his ministry of the first advent. He wasn't called by that title in the Old Testament at all. The first time it is used, the title Son of God, in the New Testament is in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3 and 6. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3 and 6 is when Satan was tempting our Lord. And when Satan questioned his validity of this title of Son of Man by saying, if you are truly the Son of God, then such and such, such and such. That's the first time you see the title of God the Son, or excuse me, the Son of God in Scripture. And what was it? You have Satan trying to allege that he really isn't. He's trying to get Christ to jump through hoops for him to prove that he is the Son of God. He was already Son of God at that time. But it was after his resurrection that the title is given. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Right, that, there was a pre, that was a precursor to it. But Son of God is like a title. And he had already, you know, in, in the baptism, he, God had already said, this is my beloved Son. But in, in Romans chapter uh, 1, verse 4, we're dealing with the title of the Son of God here, and this is the first time that it comes up. With power is the next word. So we have, and he, Jesus Christ, was declared in eternity past to be the Son of God. Now we're looking at in power. So the word there in, uh, with power is dunamis, D-U-N-A-M-I-S in the Greek. It's a noun, dative, say, uh, singular, feminine. And the definition is potential for functioning in some way Power, might, strength, force, or capability. Now, as we said already, as stated above, was declared was in the aorist tense and passive voice. We're talking about this right here. And was declared. Aorist tense and appointed time, passive voice. So what we're going to see is the power isn't talking about the power resident in Christ. It's the power that Jesus Christ received. So when we get down here to power, as stated above, it was uh, Aris tense passive voice. The humanity of Jesus received power from the Holy Spirit. Now this is why you can see what the dilemma was. Up here in the New American Standard Version, it says, the Son of God with power, like he received power, by the resurrection from the dead. And my contention is he already had power. And it was recognized, and the power came from the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Holiness, it's talking about the uh, Holy Spirit, and it was the Holy Spirit that was also played a part in Jesus' resurrection. So it makes sense that the, the power that Jesus received was to, from the Holy Spirit by his resurrection from the dead. Yes. Okay, she asks, is in eternity past, did the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit take on those roles and what? And they maintained those roles. No, it's not that they acquired or took on those roles. They are who they are. They're all deity. But Jesus Christ voluntarily submitted himself to the Father as becoming the Son of God you know, you think of a of, of, of son is lesser than the father. The father has more authority and so forth. But that's not what this is about. This title, son of God, is, this is what we said up here. Where's it, right? Where, where was that? Uh, okay. Uh, where he voluntarily, yeah, here it is, right here. Um, the good news is all about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, which is a title of Christ that expresses the voluntary submission of the second person of the Godhead to the first person for the purpose of fulfilling redemption, the plan of redemption, God's redemption, established in eternity past. So Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and God from even eternity past, they've always existed and they've always been who they are. But for us to understand the title, the Son of, Son of God, that is Jesus Christ voluntarily submitting himself to take a, uh, to become a man, which is certainly, less, it's even less than the angels, much less the uh, God. And, and the reason he did that out of his love and his Tremendous character, and so that we could be saved. You see? 
Mm -hmm. And they're still dead. Yeah, well, that, she says that they were sitting around saying, you're going to be the Father and you're going to be the Son you're going to be the Holy Spirit. Well, who would be telling them that? <laughs> they were already that. From You see, because we're inflicted with time, we can't project our minds back in eternity past and see that Jesus Christ has always been this because there's always been Jesus Christ. And from everlasting to everlasting, they know everything that was going to happen. So really, Jesus Christ was the Son of God from eternity past, but it wasn't until after he was uh, resurrected and af uh, after he finished his course and all this that he was um, acknowledged, you know, that it came to pass. Why? Okay, where are we? He was declared right here. Okay, uh, this is not the power of the direct work of Jesus Christ in his deity. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. The power we're talking is about something not in the active voice, but the passive voice. Remember, declared as is the passive and all through the period of the incarnation, it was ordained in eternity past that God the Holy Spirit would sustain the humanity of Christ and set up a pattern for the royal family in the church age. So let's, I'm nearly out of time. Let me go to this real quick here. Now, it's according to the spirit of holiness. This is what we've got so far. And was declared in eternity past to be the Son of God in power passive voice, according to the spirit of holiness. That's what we're dealing with right now. According to the spirit of holiness. This is a reference to God the Holy Spirit. So in your Bible where it says according to the spirit of Holy Spirit, put in a little bracket there or something, put uh, Holy Spirit. This is the third person of the Trinity who in the divine decrees in eternity past was ordained to sust sustain the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I added this as well. This probably also refers to the Holy Spirit's role in Jesus' resurrection. All three persons of the Trinity were involved in Jesus' resurrection. Galatians 1.1 says the Father raised Jesus from the dead. Galatians 1.1. The Father raised Jesus from the dead. 1 Peter 3.18 says that the Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. It's also here in Romans 1.4. And in Romans 8.11, clearly says that God will res resurrect believers through His Spirit as well. Here, let me show you this right here. So what I'm showing you here is the Holy Spirit had a part to play in Christ's resurrection. The God the Father and even Christ Himself did. But Romans 8.11 says, but if the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the, God, uh, from the dead, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, see the Spirit of, in our, in our verse, it says the Spirit of holiness, and that is referring to the Holy Spirit. And when it says, but if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, who would that Him be? The Holy Spirit. And the if is a first class conditional meaning, means sense, means it's, it's, it's if and it is true. It did happen. But since the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, which would be the Holy Spirit, dwells in you, He, the Holy Spirit, who raised Jesus from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who indwells you. So that takes away any question as to what the Spirit of holiness is or who it is. It's the Holy Spirit. And then in John 2, 19, Jesus predicts that he will raise himself from the dead. And also in John chapter 10, verse 18.
So you might ask the question of who re resurrected Jesus. We can say God did. Because all three members are the Godhead are God. Now, I'm fixing to get into resurrection, but I'm going to give you a, a nugget before we're done, just so you have something more to take home with you. See, we are here. We went and was declared in eternity past to be the Son of God, the title, in power according the power of the Holy Spirit, in his part resurrecting Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, I want you to look in your Bible. I want you to go to this verse. And I want you to strike out the word dead. That is an inaccurate translation. And I want you to write in death, plural. The word there is necros. I just scroll down to here where it is because I thought you'd find this interesting. Resurrected him from the dead is what it says. The word is not necros. It's an adjective. It's the genitive plural masculine. It means deaths. It does not mean dead. Means one who is no longer physically alive, dead, or dead body. Notice dead is in the plural, which refers to both the spiritual death and the physical death of Christ on the cross. And I challenge you to find that in the plural in any translation. But it's very clearly plural. Let me go down here to where. We'll, we'll just do the summation of this, like with the asterisks, so you can kind of see how this works. You see it up here with the asterisks, that right there? This is how you will see it in your Scripture, in your Bible, if you add these things to it. And Jesus Christ, in brackets, was declared declared by the divine decrees to be the Son of God in receiving power according to the spirit of holiness, the Holy Spirit, by his resurrection from death, which proved he was the Son of God. Jesus Christ our Lord. I just thought I'd throw that tidbit in. I thought it was interesting. There's also, I could, in... Um, Isaiah 53 is it says that he was um, he was buried with a rich man in his deaths plural that's in the Old Testament but they don't they don't they don't make that plural either. Yes, twice. Okay, we only have one minute. <laughs> I've got one minute for questions. Are y'all able to follow this? Okay. It's like difficult when you're trying to to get to the bottom of this. And I have so many resources but the, uh, again, the reason why I went with the ESV version is because when it says and was declared in eternity past to be the Son of God in power, I don't think he became the Son of God in power, that the power was the resurrection, but according to the Holy Spirit, by his resurrection, the Holy Spirit was part of the power that raised Jesus Christ in the resurrection 
from the death, from death. So that only took me about three hours to come to that conclusion. But it was well worth it because, um, and I'm not saying that I would, that I can guarantee you this is every jot and tittle is dead on and it's no variance whatsoever. This is a hard verse. That's why there's so many different trans, you know, uh, translations and ideas on it and all. But I think I'm, if I'm not right in the bullseye, I'm close, I believe. It's enough for us to move to the next verse shortly. Well, we made it through the heat. Thank the Lord. Let's close. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that you can take us to these verses <clears throat> that you just can't read, you just can't blow through this and say, well, I've read the Bible cover to cover. That, that means nothing. We want to stop and bring all these things in together that are included in this verse. The virgin birth, the, the divine decrees, the resurrection, all these things are technical things that have a bearing. And when we put them all together and we see what you're saying, we just rejoice and give you glory for what you've done. So we pray that you will help us to look over these notes again, read your Bible again, whatever, so that we can get the full import of this and give you all the glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Did they say when the AC was going to be fixed?